If you want to read along with me, I'm going to be in 2 Corinthians 15, and I'm going to go other places as well. But right now in 2 Corinthians 15, verse 54 through 58, the Apostle Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians 15, 54 through 58, and he says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal body shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen? So, Interestingly, in this uh, verse, we always read that, we always read, O death, where is your victory? O grave, where is your sting? Did I give you the wrong verse? Yeah. Uh, okay, for, what did I say? Okay, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, now that you're there and the spirit of confusion is lifted, we can go on. Okay. You know, interestingly, uh, in this, these verses, one of the interesting things, we always focus on death, where is your victory? Grave is where, your, where is your sting? But then we're told that the sting of the grave, we're told that, the, the, that the, the sting of death is sin. Let's read it again. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, think, process this a little bit. Think about this. Jesus was perfect, Right? He was God 100% wrapped in human flesh. He was the only perfect man that ever lived. He lived without sin. Now, I want you to think about this. If Jesus was God, then the law was authored by Jesus. The law was given by God. It was God's law. The very same law that God authored turned on him and killed its creator. The very same law that God created, turned on the only perfect man, and killed him. Think about that, really. How foolish it is to try to live by our own merits, by our own goodness, to try to stand by the own good that we've done, you know, by putting enough tithing, or coming to church enough, or living a good enough, or a holy enough life. How stupid that is, because the only man that ever did that the law still turned on him, and he was crucified. His life wasn't taken. He laid his life down freely. But the law which he himself authored turned upon him. But the good news is that the grave couldn't hold him. Amen? Because he was without sin. And because uh, he was just and the justifier of those that believe, and he rose again from the grave. So not only did he arise the victor from the dark domain, but he also broke all the bars of hell. And I love that. That's one of the verses in that, in that song. He broke the bars of hell. The bars of hell are broke. It's wide open, man. Nobody has to stay in the grave anymore. Nobody has to uh, suffer and die for an eternity because Jesus uh, has broken the bars of hell. We must learn to look over all of our enemies and look into the eyes of Christ. If we'll place our eyes on Christ, we'll find that he stands much taller than our enemies. When it's over our head, it's under his feet. Amen? If we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll find that he's standing much taller than our enemies. Our enemies may look big. They may look like mountains. They may look like Goliaths. But Jesus stands taller. Amen? And we can always keep our eyes on Christ. We have to learn to look beyond the heads of our enemies. Because a lot of times what we do is we look at our enemies. And when we start looking at our enemies, we get fearful. Uh, like when the Israelites, when they were going into the, the land, the spies, when they spied out the land, and they said, but, but we're like grasshoppers in their sight. The people of the land didn't say that. 
The spies said that. The spies saw themselves as grasshoppers in the sight of the people. Now, if the truth be told, the people of the land were very afraid of the Israelites. They were very afraid of the advancing army. But when, when, they, when the Israelites that were spying out the land looked at their enemies, rather than looking beyond their enemies and looking at the promise that God had given them, when they looked into the faces of their enemies, they said, Oh, Lord, but we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They began to diminish in their, their own sight, and they began to uh, make their enemies out to be more than they were. Hebrews 12.2 is actually a wonderful uh, Resurrection Day uh, verse. Hebrews 12.2, you'll know it well. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking beyond his enemies is exactly what Jesus did. He looked beyond the cross, and he looked to the joy that was set before him. He looked to us. Praise God for that. We're the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross for us. I love, again, just because it's so fresh and we just watched it last night, how well they did in that movie, The Passion, on illustrating this. How Jesus would, I, I, in particular, I noticed it when he was in Herod's court. When, when he was before Herod and all the people were drunk and they were staggering around and they were laughing at him and they were mocking at him. And Jesus looked up and he saw the one man standing there with the staff. And his gaze penetrated the man's heart, and the man put his head down. And you, you could tell just by, the, uh, just by the filmography or however you want to say it, you could tell that the gospel had touched the man's heart. You could tell when Jesus stood before Pilate. I love how they did that in that movie, how Pilate was struggling because truth was right before his face, and he was trying to decide if he was going to believe the truth or believe a lie. He was struggling with the truth that was right before him. It just they, they constructed that movie so well uh, with things like that because that's exactly what Jesus did. He looked beyond the cross. He didn't go for the multitudes. He went for the few. Do you remember how many times? Do you know that something like 90% of the time the miracles recorded in Scripture were for individuals? Jesus was on his way to, to an event or to a, a meeting or to a house and a woman would touch the hem of his garment or someone would call and they would call out for mercy or a blind man sitting by the road would cry out and Jesus would turn from the multitude and he would turn to the individual. Jesus knew how to look past all of his enemies and look to the prize. Amen? And if it would have been one person, we've said it many times, but if it would have been one person, he would have still went to the cross for that one person. Is that right? Is that the truth? Because he knew how to look past his enemies. He looked past the head of his enemies and he looked unto the promise. And it says uh, that because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He went through the trouble. Now, it's amazing to me how much in our human nature we try to avoid the struggle. We try to avoid the trouble, thinking that we're going to somehow spare ourselves some pain, when in reality, if we'll just face the enemy, if we'll just look over his head, if we'll just look in the eyes of Jesus, if we'll just trust his grace and face the enemy, then we're going to walk through all of our enemies as if they don't even exist. Some of them might wound us and leave some scars, but they're not taking us down and they're not taking us out because, again, I've read the book many times and we always win at the end. Amen? Uh, many of the 207 people that were killed last night, uh, yesterday morning in Sri Lanka, but last night for us, many of them were in churches worshiping Jesus, their Savior. Uh, I got news for you, the terrorists didn't win. Right. Amen? They just got to go to glory on a holy day. Now, we don't want to see people suffer, and you know, obviously we don't want to see all of that, but they won because they went through all of the... The enemy said, I'm going to blow up some Christians... But the Christians just got promoted to glory. Amen. And the terrorist bombers went to hell. Or they're preparing to go to hell. Uh, and that's, that's just how it works because he'll always defeat our enemies. Sometimes it'll look like defeat in the natural, but we walk by faith. We, we don't walk by sight. Jude verse 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God and look to the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Look to the mercy of God. Many times our enemies, our sins, their shortcomings, many times our, in, uh, our enemies are coming up short. Anyone ever not been good enough in this place? 
<laughs> Anyone ever tried your hardest and done your worst in this place? Oftentimes those are our enemies. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy and we're our own hardest critic. Don't get me wrong, we should be repentant and we should be sorry for sin, but we got to learn to look past that sin consciousness after we've repent, repented and look past that guilt and look under the mercy of the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, I've put my hope in the Lord and my hope in the Lord is for mercy. You want to do an interesting story, story, study? Uh, you, know what the, the, you know what the throne of God is called? The mercy seat. See, people will say, oh, that's the judgment seat. That's the place where he's going to uh, condemn everybody for every evil word spoken, every wrong that they've done. He named his own seat the mercy seat. Amen. He named his own chair. Now that's the place from where he is going to judge. But those that hope in the mercy of the Lord, those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ, they will not find judgment in that place. They will find mercy. God said it. I didn't say it. He said, I'll have mercy upon who? I'll have mercy. He said, in the very place it was said of them, they're not the people of God. I will say that they are my people. They are the people of God. He has declared his own seat, his own throne of judgment to be the mercy seat. That's the entire message of the cross that we should have been on the cross yes we deserve the cross yes we yes we deserve death we deserve to be placed in the grave and to stay there never to rise again we deserve to go to the deepest depths of Hades the deepest depths of hell but because of the mercy of God we don't have to amen, amen? Jesus went to the lowest place and he broke the chains. He defeated our enemy and he left, led captivities captive like a victorious train. And uh, he opened heaven. So now to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That's the message of Easter. <laughs> they used to have to go down to uh, paradise for a little bit. Remember the thief on the cross? Jesus said, today you'll join me in paradise. Because Jesus went to paradise and he, he didn't just unlock the thing. He broke the door off the hinges. He broke the gates open. Now to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Amen. There's no more going, hey man, I, I like visiting paradise on earth, but I'm not going to paradise when I die. I'm going to heaven. It's a much better place. Amen? Because the power of the grave has been broken. Our worst enemy has been defeated. And I'm hoping, you say, but pastor, look at all the stupid things you've done. Oh brother, I could make a longer list than you could make for me. I guarantee it's the truth. But I'm not hoping in judgment. I'm hoping in the mercy of God. Amen. I didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. Yes. Why waste his sacrifice? Yes. Give him your guilt. Give him your condemnation. Give him your sin. And I'm speaking, I believe, to all Christians here today. And I, how many of you know Christians need this message? Oh yeah, I'm forgiven. And you're going to walk under a cloud of guilt, of doom, of gloom, of, of defeat. For years and years and years, when if you'll give it to God and hope in His mercy, hope in His grace, and know that when, when you approach Him, if you approach through the blood, if you approach through faith in Jesus, what's going to happen when you stand before Him? What's going to happen is not judgment, but grace and mercy. You, you know, see, someone always has to pay for the, the crime, Someone always has to do the time. Someone always has to pay the penalty. But the point is that Jesus did it on our behalf. Amen. So we don't have to. Why serve double time? He paid it on our behalf so that we don't have to. And if you're not a believer here today, it's as easy as putting your faith in Jesus. You don't have to make a big show about it. You just got to trust him. And uh, there, are, there is such a thing as wandering sheep too. Am I speaking to believers today? <laughs> because, uh, because if you think that you don't wander sometimes, you just wandered because you just lied. Lord, bind our wandering hearts to you. But there's mercy. And he's the good shepherd that comes out and he seeks us. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't just rise from the dead and say, find your way to where I'm at? He rose from the dead and he's coming back to get us. Amen? Amen. He rose from the dead and then he walked for 40 days upon the earth, revealing himself to men. Because he didn't just rise from the dead and say, if, 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 if you want it, just go discover it. Just find your way. If, you, you know, if you're so messed up, you can't see it. No, he came and he saw. I love the story of, of doubting Thomas because you know I'm going to go here. But Thomas gets the label of being the doubter, Thomas. But Thomas 
according to church history. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but according to church history, Thomas ended up going further than any of the other apostles. You know where he went? He went all the way to South India, to Chennai. I've stood in the church of Thomas the apostle, and it's the oldest church in the world. Thomas established that church. He was killed by the Brahmins as a martyr, but his blood still cries out to this day. And, and God sent two apostles to the land of India. Bartholomew in the north, and Thomas went all the way to the south. The doubter became perhaps the man that traveled the furthest of the original 12 apostles for Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? And his blood still cries out and it still yields fruit today. And there will be much more fruit yielded in India uh, uh, for that. Now, <laughs> um, he didn't send an apostle to America, an original one, but he sent you and I to declare the, the good news. Amen? So we need to, we need to do that. It's just what Jesus did. He looked beyond the pain. He looked beyond the cross, and he looked to the joy that was set before him. Look beyond the head of your enemies. Set your hopes upon the reward that's to be given in Christ. And even if you don't see it in this life, you're going to see it. Amen? Look up. Set your mind on things that are above, not upon these earthly, these carnal things. Now, the word said here that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. I love that because what he started, he finishes. Jesus says, I started it and I'm going to finish it. That is one of the distinguishing marks of a true believer. If Jesus planted the faith, if Jesus started the faith, he's going to watch over it and he's going to finish what he started. Yes. See, the, I, I got a big problem with this where people say, you know, uh, they got saved and then uh, God just don't care about them. He's just letting them fall. No, man. He, he leaves the 99. He goes after the wandering sheep. He seeks and he saves that which is lost. If he'll do it for, if he'll come to seek and save the lost, how much more for his own children? Amen. Hey, I'll tell you what, if a man was laying on the street over there bloody and bleeding, I would be the first one out the door to go help the man any way that I could. How much more my own children? Amen. Come on, have a proper view of who God is. You got to know your father because if you don't know him, the enemy will fill you with all kinds of lies. But the, Jesus has broken the power of every enemy. Yeah. He's broken the power of every lie. He's broken the power of every deception. That's why he died. He defeated the greatest enemy, the enemy that nobody could vo boast in victory over. Jesus defeated the enemy, which is called death. Yeah. And he defeated sin. And he rose again in righteousness and in truth. And now we're partakers in his grace. I have way too many scriptures to share here today. But Psalm 121, because I know it's Easter. And I can't be naughty today. i got to let you out on time. But Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. The Lord's our helper. It says in that psalm that the Lord is our keeper, that the Lord will watch over us, that he's not asleep, that he's not slumbering, that he's not sleeping, but he's seeking us out. He's watching over us. Uh, it says all of that in Psalm 121. We can look to the Lord for our help. We can look beyond our enemies. We can look to the Lord, our keeper. We can look to the Lord as our preserver. And that's all because he broke the power of the greatest enemy. He broke the power of sin and the power of the grave. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, Philip and I actually, uh, some of my chattering yesterday, Philip went and helped make boxes yesterday. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about founding fathers of the nation and how they had, you know, they had a lot of different views. They weren't all just like, uh, mainline Christians or something, but they all, every one of the founders, every one of them had an understanding of original sin, that man is broken, man is flawed, inherently man is bad, and you know, God's gracious, I believe that, you know, he receives the children and aborted babies and young ones that die before an age of accountability, I believe there's precedent for all of that, but basically everybody's born broken, and you can see it in any two-year-old. <laughs> right? Once you get to two years old, you can see it. No. And what are they going to go for? They're going to go for the no. Man is broken. Today, the problem is, is that the, the mindset, this is one of the problems in our nation. The mind sh sh mindset has shifted, and we believe we're the Star Trek generation. We believe everybody's good, and we're eventually going to overcome because of our goodness. You know, man is basically good. He's just had a lot of setbacks and been in the wrong environment. 
Certainly that's an influence on our lives, but the real problem is, is that man was broken, you were born a sinner, and so was I, every one of us. Because of Adam's fall, and because you're Adam's descendant, you were born into sin, and you were destined to sin. The flavor of sin may vary between us. The severity of, of how man would rate the severity of sin may vary between us, but all were born into sin, all are broken, all are lost. The Founding Fathers knew that. That's why they had all the checks and balances in our government. And they weren't really, they didn't want to come under another king. Amen. Right? Because they might have a good king this time, but we don't know how his son is going to be. So they put all these checks and balances uh, in, into place. Well, you know, here's the thing. Jesus defeated that thing for us. He makes all things new. He defeated the sin of our past. You don't have to lie to God. You can be honest with God. You know, sometimes people say, what if people find out I'm a sinner? Guess what? You've already been found out. <laughs> what if people find out what I did? Well, uh, you, you can... Let me talk to you. Can we, can we just talk for just a minute as friends? I just, again, the movie again last night, since it's fresh and we just watched it, it reminded me of, of Jesus' words. Well, some of his last words were... As I've loved you, love one another. Amen. What has Jesus Christ covered in your life that you pray to God nobody ever knows? <laughs> so if you find something out, are you going to go put it on Facebook or the newspaper or make sure that you go tell people so they'll know that you knew first? Or are you going to love them even as you've been loved? Amen. I got news for you. You were born a sinner. Now you want the good news, the best news ever? When you put your faith in Jesus, you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint. Amen. You say, but pastor, I still sin. Yes, but that's not your nature. Now you're a sinner saved by grace. Emphasis on the grace. You're not the same thing that you used to be when you put your faith in Jesus. You still mess up, but the power of sin has been broken. And it's a good thing because if the power of sin had not been broken, death still has a hold on you. The reason that Jesus rose from the grave was because death had no hold on him. Sin was the hold of death. Because of sin came death. And every man is trapped in the grave. It's their prison because of sin. But when we put our faith in Jesus, we become a new creation. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Our sin goes upon Him, and His righteousness comes upon us, and we die and we go into the grave, and here's what happens. Death and Hades and hell cannot hold us because they don't see us. They see Jesus. Amen. They see a Son of God, just like Jesus was a Son of God, and we rise from the grave, and someday our body's going to rise to meet Him. Yes. That's what it says. Uh, the Spirit's going to go to be with the Lord now, but we're going to receive new bodies, is what the Word says. Amen? So we can, again, look beyond all of our enemies, and we can look unto His promises. Psalm 121 says, I, lift, I just read it, but I lift my eyes up to the hills from where comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and He made the earth. We can trust that promise. God will help us. Yeah. We are not alone. He will help us. We can look to Him. Now, our enemies sometimes can look overpowering, but we just got to fix our eyes on Jesus and realize the victory that He's won. One of my favorite Old Testament Bible stories is where the king of Aram sent an army to capture Elisha. And they said, uh, uh, the, the king said, Who's the spy in the camp? Who's giving out all the secrets? Why are we always defeated in these battles? And his, one, one of his men came and said, but, but king, you don't understand. There's a prophet in Israel that he even understands the words that you utter in your bedchamber. And so the king of Aram said, go down and get that man. Go down and capture him. I want to talk to him. And so the troops, they started going down and they went down to capture Elisha and his servant was there and his servant was afraid because the enemy was coming and there were so many. And and Elisha said, don't worry, son. There are more on our side than are on their side. And Elisha prayed that, the eyes, that uh, his eyes would be open and they saw the chariots and the armies of the Lord all around. Now remember, it only took one angel to slay uh, 185,000 Assyrians in one night, I believe it was. Wow, one angel. Imagine what a whole army of angels is going to do if our eyes were just open to see it. And Elijah prayed, and the, the troop was struck with blindness. 
And then Elisha said, this isn't the right city. Follow me. I'll take you back to the right place. And Elisha led him up to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said, what do I do with all these people? Should we kill them? And Elisha said, no, they've already been defeated. Just feed them and send them back to their land. They won't mess with you anymore. Feed the, your enemies. When they're thirsty, give them something to drink. They've already been defeated. Don't worry about... In other words, don't worry about your enemies. They've already been defeated. I know that one of our capacities, and I'm speaking from experience, is to get too fixated on our enemies, too worried about our enemies. But here's the thing. Just pretend like they're not even there half the time. You know what faith does? It just does it anyway. Amen. Faith just does it anyway. It just, it, it just goes anyway. You know, I mean, we use wisdom. Don't get me wrong. But if you think uh, this thing in Sri Lanka is going to make me not go back to Sri Lanka, you better read another newspaper because it ain't going to happen. Uh, as, if the doors are open, I'm going. Because you, you can be safe on anywhere you go with Jesus, you're safe. Amen. And uh, if it's time to go, then it's time to go. And you ain't going to be you're not going to stay a day longer in Ohio than you're going to stay in Sri Lanka. If it's your time to go meet Jesus as a believer that's trusting him, that's just how how it's going to be. Uh, but you don't have to worry about your enemies. Faith doesn't. Man, I don't do this because I. I don't want to magnify my enemy. I want to magnify my God. I got at least three things going on in my life right now that some people would not even be able to stand here and proclaim. But I'm not going to magnify my enemies. I'm not even going to tell you what my enemies are this morning because I'm going to tell you who my God is. And he defeated the greatest of all enemies. He broke the power of sin and death. He broke the grave and he led captivity out. Now it says in Romans 5, 17 that, that what I get is I get to reign in life. I get to reign in life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I get to reign in spite of my enemies. I get to have a table spread before me. I get to, people get to watch the video. They get to hear the reports. They get to say, I don't know if that's really Pastor Dave uh, overseas. That doesn't sound like, the, that doesn't sound like the, the, the person that we know. Good. Watch. Behold. See the works of the Lord. Yeah. Know that it's marvelous in our eyes. It's the doing of the Lord. It's not something that we could rot or work by our own manipulation or ingenuity or authority or power but I'm telling you my God has broken the power of the grave and he said that if we'll stand in faith we will reign in this life in him reign as kings hallelujah how do you think Jesus sees kingship how do you think Jesus sees reigning? I'll tell you what, you know, right now they may be bombing his churches and they may be persecuting his people, but he's coming back to set up a throne, a physical throne on the Mount of Olives. <laughs> and they're not even going to look at him cross-eyed or funny when that day happens. Amen. But for right now, we're trying to pluck people out. Amen. For right now, there are still those that need to be saved. They need to hear the message of their loving Father. So this is not the day of that judgment. But I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back to reign. Amen? And because we know that, because we believe that, then we can reign now in life over our enemies. Amen. Look it up. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. If you want to read it, I don't want to go there this morning because that ain't even where I'm headed. Praise the Lord. Uh, who are our enemies? They're all evil spirits, dominions and powers and thoughts and lofty things that exalt themselves against our God. Because let me tell you, his enemies are my enemies and my enemies are his enemies. Thank God for that revelation. Sometimes people think, well, you know, God has enemies, but he won't fight for me. Baloney, you're the bride of Christ. You're the child of God. I'll tell you right now, I get after my kids. I love them. They're great kids. I'm blessed with my kids. I get after them, but you let somebody come after my kids that shouldn't come after my kids. And you'll find out that their enemies are my enemies. I love my wife, but you come up. I mean, uh, you know, my wife and I might get a little sassy sometimes with you. I know you don't think the pastor's family does that, but it might happen every now and then. But you know what? You get too sassy with my wife, and you're going to find out that her enemies are my enemies, and my enemies are her enemies. Yeah. Amen? My kids may mess up and do a grievous thing. I pray that they won't have any pain in their life, that they don't need to be who God wants them to be. But I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, you know who I'm standing with? I'm standing with my kids. I'm standing with my kids. And uh, I'm going to stand with my wife. Amen. And I'm going to stand with my people. Yes. Amen? We got some, some problems here, but we're a wonderful church. Wonderful church. And 
if people want to come and point out the problems, guess who I'm going to stand with at the end of the day? It's good to have a few enemies in your life. But you've got to learn to look past your enemies, and you've got to learn to look into the eyes of Jesus. The world is full of enemies. It's full of evil spirits and devils and sin and sickness and lack and poverty and disease and want and even death. But Jesus has broken their power, and he's placed them on open display. Hallelujah! Praise God! He didn't just break their power in secret. He put them on open display, and he's fighting for us now. Uh, I heard a great message by Louis Giglio, I think is how you say his name, kind of a, a known pastor, and uh, he, wonderful message. It really spoke to me about how oftentimes we read the story of David and Goliath, and we view ourselves as David, which, okay, good, good point, but we view ourselves as David, and I'm going to come against my enemies, my Goliath's in the way, I'm going to get my sling and the word, and I'm going to speak the word, I'm going to overcome my enemies, okay, that's all good, but really, that's not what's happening, because if you remember the story, and if you remember, if you know your Old Testament, you know that David is a type of Christ. Yeah. David is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. He represents Christ. So really, what's happening in the story of David and Goliath is not that I'm fighting my Goliath and defeating him, but my God is fighting my Goliath yeah. and defeating him. And my God has not only knocked him down, but he's cut off his head. Yeah. With his own sword. Ooh, that's, oh, you're prophesying, woman. Oh, that's good stuff. God did that for you. The very things that the enemy raised up against you because you're a child of God, because you're the bride of God. Jesus has taken up your battle and he's fought it himself. He's knocked down your Goliath and he's cut off his head. Now, you know, all, all that we got to do is we got to rally behind him. We're more like the, the Israelites that were cowering, you know, looking at, they were looking at their Goliath and they were cowering. But once David cut off his head, they rallied behind him and they possessed the land and they struck down the enemy. That's what you're called to do. You don't have to take out Goliath, Jesus will do that for you. Just rally behind him and go out valiantly and boldly against your enemy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All your enemies are struck down. All your enemies are cast down. He's defeated death. Death is, you know, we may still fear death, but there's no reason to fear death as a believer because it's no longer a pit. It's no longer a grave. It's just a thin veil. You walk right through it into the arms of Jesus. The angels will be standing there waiting to receive you. Jesus will be standing there waiting to receive you. There will be no delay. It'll be absent from the body, present with the Lord because he wants to be with you. You know, he wanted to be with Enoch so bad that he couldn't wait anymore. Hallelujah. That's how he wants to be with us. And we're going to be just called up from the body to be with him. Our greatest enemy has been defeated by our great God. And we don't need to fear any of the little guys anymore. We can look over their heads and by faith you just do it anyway. Hallelujah. You don't need money. Uh-oh, I'm preaching to the preacher here. You know what you need? You need a word from God. You need to stand on the word from God. That word from God as you stand on it will produce the money that you need. That's right. Come on, somebody. Somebody ought to say, that's good preaching right now. You stand on the word. The word will produce for you. He's the God of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof. You work the word. The word will work. You say, I need healing. Now, I, I know I, I pray for healing, too, and I understand it. But really, that's not good theology because you were healed 2,000 years ago on the cross. You know what you need to do? You need to work the word. And so do I. So do I. I get tested like you get tested. I'm the shepherd that lives with the sheep. You got to work the word, man. You stand. Thank you, Jesus, that you healed me, that by your stripes I was made healed. Uh, you, you, well, God, I just need someone to help me out of sin. No, you need to stand upon the word that he, he died for our sins upon the cross, that all things have become new, that the old has been made new. You work the word and the word will work. Amen. Come on. Somebody just wanted some tradition today, but you're going to get a word that's going to motivate you in this place this morning in Jesus' name. Our worst enemy has been defeated. Its stinger has been taken out. Uh, I always think it's funny when, uh, you might correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think I'm wrong. You see a bumblebee flying by and everyone cringes, but it has no stinger. Bumblebees can't sting. I have like this memory like I was stung by a bumblebee, but it has to be a false memory like as a kid because 
if I'm not mistaken, I looked it up once, and bumblebees have no stinger to sting you with. The bumblebees, everyone's afraid because they look big and fat and like they're going to attack you. They don't sting people. They don't sting people, bumblebees. They bore holes in wood. There's the wood borers that bore holes in wood. And so look it up. Somebody look at you. all got Google and Facebook and, and phones. Look it up. Make sure I'm right. But bumblebees, they don't sting people. You get afraid of them. They look big. Somebody look it up and correct me if I need it because I want to be corrected if I need it. But uh, they fly by and you get scared. That's the little ones, man. Those are the ones, the yellow jackets and stuff. Those will, those will get you, won't they? But, you know, death, so odious, so big, so powerful, so undefeatable, so fearful. And it should be because all men are going to pass through the grave if he doesn't return first. But at the same time, Jesus has taken the stinger out of it. Amen. There's nothing to fear. The thing that looks the most fearful of everything that could be done to us, there's nothing to fear. Hallelujah. You're going to walk through the veil and you're going to be uh, with the Lord. I love this story of Moses as they were walking as they were walking through the parted sea. They were preparing to walk through it in Exodus 14:13. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, but stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord today for these Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. We can replace the word Egyptians with the word enemies. These enemies that you see today, you shall never see them again. And I'm prophesying to somebody in this place, you're, you feel like you're out there on the on the front line fighting several enemies and like you're going to be subdued but I'm telling you in a suddenly in a moment in an instant God will subdue your enemies and these enemies that stand before you you will never see them again Amen. glory to God the grave has been defeated sin has been defeated sickness has been defeated depressions and sorrows have been defeated hallelujah Jesus conquered them all and we share his victory our enemies are his enemies. His enemies are our enemies. Amen. He defeated his enemies. That means our enemies are defeated too. Amen. If we'll just realize it and announce it. Back in Luke chapter 24, the resurrection scripture, just a, a few verses, verses 5 through 8. We look over the heads of our enemies when we stand in the life that Christ offers. It says, Then... They were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth. They said to them, the angel said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words. The reason I include that here this morning is because if you look at the original Greek, it says the, the living is not here among the dead. But what it actually says is the living one is not here. The living one is not here among the tombs. So many people are looking for Jesus in the wrong place. Oh, I got to go through my suffering to get close to Jesus. I got to go through my sickness to get close with Jesus. I got to go through my incarceration to get close close with Jesus. I got to go through my poverty to get close. Why are you looking for the living one among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He's defeated our enemies. Quit looking for Jesus in all the wrong places. Live in victory. Live in faith. Believe God. Believe the word of God. Hallelujah. This is such a good message. We got to quit being silent about it. There's no such thing as a silent majority within the church. You have to speak. Man, the sacrifice that he made, the price that he paid, the victory that he won. How can we stay silent on such things? He's the living one. Quit looking for him among the dead. Why are you looking for him among merits and dead works and strivings? Why are you doing that? He's not here. Yes. Come on, somebody. You won't find Jesus in the graveyard unless he's just there to comfort somebody. <laughs> unless he's just there to give some directions. John chapter 11, 25 through 27, in the resurrection of Lazarus, when Jesus raised him up, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though he die, and who, 
ever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. You see, he's not just the one who resurrects. He is the resurrection and the life. He's not just the one who makes alive. He is the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you believe this? Let it take hold of your inner man. Let it take hold of, of, of let the roots sink deep into your heart. Believe that he's the living one. If you, you're never standing alone if you put your faith in Jesus. He's defeated your enemies. Acts 17, 28 says, In Him we live, we move, we have our being. In Him we live, we move, we have our being. We're alive in Him. We're alive because He's alive and we trust in Him. Yes. Hallelujah. Do you believe this? Yes. Do you really believe this? Yes. Do you really believe this? Do you believe that because He lives, I will live? Because he lives, as the song says, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all of my fear can be gone. Because he lives, my enemies shall not defeat me. Because they're already defeated and just haven't got the message yet. Because he lives, I'll look over their heads. And I'll look to him that stands taller than all of my enemies. Because as the song says again, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over all of our foes. He arose as the victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with us. We're the saints. To reign. That's talking about now. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We reign now. We reign in Him because we're alive in Him now. As He is, so are we in the world. Not so as will we be, but as He is, so are we in this world. We reign in this life because Jesus has conquered our enemies. Yeah. They're just doing everything they can to keep the word from getting out. You know, uh, I, I briefly said it in Sunday school, but... People think that sometimes reports from the mission field and stuff are embellished, and I try not to do that. Uh, there are other people with me that can validate things, but uh, the, the reports, why, you know, why, you know, like I talk about the, the village where one known believer and 55 people that night accepted Christ. The prayer meeting where eight people accepted Christ. The next night a prayer meeting, six people accepted Christ. Well, uh, there may be a lot of reasons that happens, but let me tell you one of the things that happens in the spirit, there's a strong man. Yes. And it's like a spigot on a faucet that when it's closed, people, there might be a whole reservoir of people that want to, they just haven't heard. They don't know. I mean, you're speaking to people that some of them have literally never heard the name of Christ. Yeah. I read an article. This, this was not personal experience. I read an article the other day about a missionary that he was witnessing to, to some of these folks. And they said, oh, Jesus seems like a nice man. Is he from your village? Where's your village? I would like to meet him. Because you see, they haven't heard the name. Many, many have not heard the name. There are almost 7,000 unreached people groups yet upon this planet today. Many have not heard the name. But it's like a spigot. There's a strong man, a spiritual power, a force, sometimes a physical person that is in place that when you get past that strong man, there literally is a whole reservoir of people that will believe. You've got you to open the spigot. Friends, we have the victory. In your life, there are strong men that you're wrestling against. There's a little cog in the wheel. A little, you know, the, the spigot is turned. But when you stand and proclaim the victory of Jesus Christ, when you stand in his life, when you stand in his victory, and you open that spigot, when you remove that clog, you'll be amazed. You'll live in the supernatural. We're called to live in the supernatural. Hallelujah. I want to go to higher levels of supernatural. Hallelujah. Some people think that I'm already living in the supernatural. Good. Keep thinking that because you're right. <laughs> if, if I'm wrong, don't, don't tell me that because I don't, sometimes I'm better off when I don't know anything. Okay? When you don't know how it's supposed to be, you can't get stuck in it. Right. Come on, somebody. I've had, you know, we're coming up on seven years at Ithaca. Wonderful seven years. Now, I wish that every pew was full, and I wish that great thing. About, I, I, I don't know about all that, but I can tell you in seven years, we've never missed a bill. I can tell you in seven years, we've bought property. I can tell you in seven years, look at the number of people in this church. In seven years, my wife has been an at-home mom with four 
with four kids in the nest. Uh, and I can tell you that most of the time I haven't driven junk in the seven years. Most of the time I haven't dressed in junk in the seven years. And the seven years I've taken, I think, at least seven mission trips. I was trying to count them. I think I've taken seven. Uh, it might be six, six or seven in the last seven years. And I've come back on every one of them without any debt in the bank. And it's going to keep happening that way. Well, you say, well, pastor, you're boasting. I'll boast all day in the Lord because my enemy's been defeated. My enemy's been yeah. defeated. My enemy's been defeated. Come on, he's been defeated. It's not the testimony of the pastor. It's the testimony of those that follow God, those that believe God, those that reign in life because the enemy's been defeated. Hallelujah. I probably should start getting some malaria pills. I've never bought them up until this point. Praise God that I haven't had malaria or some, some uh, disease or some sickness or some something. But you know what? The enemy's been defeated. Hallelujah. He's been cast down. Hallelujah. And uh, 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 you guys are visiting and Larry is visiting this morning, but you guys have watched it develop. Look, don't, don't judge us by what you see. We got the meeting in Piqua. We got the meeting happening in New Madison. And yeah, there are small things, but, but just be faithful. Just be faithful to the Lord. We got the meeting happening this afternoon at the nursing home. Hey, look, I, I get it that people may have family coming and stuff. There's, there, there, there's no, no judgment. But a lot of churches won't go on Easter Sunday to the nursing home. But we'll go and we'll have a good showing. We'll have five or ten people, at least probably more than that, probably at, at the nursing from this church. Look at this. You know, uh, I can't tell you uh, uh, some things I can't speak to you about. I, I just don't have the answer for so many things. But I can tell you we are walking in the supernatural. We are living in the supernatural. But what's happening is God's opening this spigot and we're going to see greater things. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Greater things. God is doing wonderful things, not because anything to do with our own merits at all, but because of the grace and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And in that grace, we stand. Hallelujah. We look beyond our enemies and we set our eyes upon Christ. We look beyond our enemies and we look to his promise. We look beyond our enemies because he has subdued them and we're just announcing it. We look beyond our enemies because they will fade and die. It'll pass. Amen. We look beyond our enemies and we simply believe because he's alive. We're alive. I'm alive in life and I'm alive in death because he is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father in Jesus.